pleasure to be here. Oh, well, you're welcome. I'm glad to have you. Let's go back, first of all, to the early days of your career and tell me about how you started singing, because I understand that it was first gospel music that you performed. Is that correct? Well, I grew up in the church uh, singing gospel music here in Sevier County, and also we were invited to sing at funerals and at weddings or whatever, so I grew up thinking of myself as a singer. And shortly after I got out of high school, I already was married and had a baby, and I took a job in Washington, D.C., working in a club to buy baby milk. And I, I kind of laughingly say in my show now that I've always made enough money to stay in the business, but not enough to get out. <laughs> so, but it did start out as gospel music. And did it seem to be a natural progression for you to go from gospel music to writing and singing country music? Well, I grew up writing as well. Most of my siblings, uh, we all would sit around and make up songs. We called it making up songs. And so then as we got to be adults, we realized when we got to Nashville that you were a songwriter if you made up songs. <laughs> so I still say we make up songs. Tell me about your first hit song, which you also wrote, I Want to Hold You in My Arms Tonight. Uh, in 1975, that was, uh, uh, it's a very personal song to me because uh, it was first of all my first hit and it also gave me a career, gave me an opportunity to go out and have a song to be able to be booked on the strength of for a long time. I wrote that song about my son. I was, I've been a single parent most of his life and while I was out on the road I was trying to write a lot of truck driver songs because I, that was the big trend back in the mid-70s and I thought if I can write a hit uh, song, a truck driving song, then I can probably get myself a record deal. Well, in the process of uh, writing these truck driving songs, I wrote I Want to Hold You in My Dreams tonight, one night out on the road, and uh, it became a top ten record for me, and I'm grateful. So who are some of the musical influences of Stella Parton? I think Mother Maybelle Carter was always an influence on me because she was a female. She was a musician. She was a mom. And she was uh, what a lot of people uh, call me as a renaissance woman. She did everything from, you know, she was a career woman, a, a mother, and um, musician. She kind of kept up with the guys in, in the musical department. She could, she uh, developed a style of uh, playing that uh, I find to, that a lot of people have still used and still are using her style of uh, 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 finger picking on the guitar so I think she was a big influence on me and she still was feminine and still <laughs> a mom and that was and she was from the mountains of Virginia uh, so she was a mountain woman as well your diverse talents have allowed you to be a spokesperson an entrepreneur an author an entertainer how have you been able and to mom. do and mom yeah right. of course how have you been able to do all of that um, I'm scared you know, um, Regis uh, Philbin asked me the other day when I was on Kathleen Regis, he says, you women are really smart, you part and women are really smart. And I told him, I said, no, we're not really smart at all. We're just afraid that we will end up in a house without indoor plumbing. So, you know, we just work hard. We're, you know, you just manage to balance it all out and try to stay organized as much as you can. But you always have to have a, an ultimate goal in mind. And once you finish a, a project, then go on to something else. Don't. Uh, I think that's what happens with a lot of people is they forget to set other goals. Have so many goals that you've always got something to go on to. When you get this one, set out to attain another one. Oh yeah, absolutely. Tell me about your work in motion pictures. Well, I've been lucky enough to uh, appear in a few uh, films. Um, I was, uh, the first experience I had was I had a, a small part in a film called uh, um, Gosh, it wasn't The Loner. The Loner was the last one I did, and that was with David Hevner. And then I was in Country Gold, and uh, then I was in Cloud Dancer. That was the first one that I had an experience with, working with a film crew and so on and so forth. And the first television experience I had as an, uh, an acting person was uh, 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 Dukes of Hazard, And that was a lot of fun. But my greatest uh, experience and my most rewarding experience as far as acting is concerned would be the musicals that I've uh, been fortunate enough to star in. I've never done a bit part. I'd like to do some less pressure roles at some point. I've, I started out as the lead in uh, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, which was a big challenge for me, and I realized at that point that I was either tough as nails or maybe I had a little bit of talent or maybe I was some of both because I was able to 
to learn that and pull that off within nine days without any acting or dancing or um, not even being able to read music and, and that turned out to be a very positive growing experience for me. I think Stella probably any interview or any visit with you would not be complete unless we talked about your talents in the kitchen and your cookbooks. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your cookbooks and is cooking something that you continue to do on a regular basis even though I know you're so busy with your career? Well cooking is a way that I feel like you can nurture people and you can uh, express a warmth and a nurturing uh, part of yourself with people. I, I don't know if you like to cook or not but it's a creative thing. It's a therapeutic thing for me when I've been trying to sort out problems or if I've been exhausted like on the road or whatever. I like to get in my kitchen. It's a comforting way to you know sort things out. And um, I started collecting recipes when I was about nine years old. I was always fascinated with the way they were lined up on the page or on the back of a pet milk can or whatever, <laughs> or on a cocoa box. It's like, oh, I'm going to write that off or whatever. So I still have a box of recipes that are in my handwriting from when I was about that age. And so I'm on my second cookbook now. Lord knows where it'll turn, you know, what it'll turn into. Can I ask you what some of your favorite recipes are in the cookbook? Well, uh, some of my favorite dishes are things like dumplings and potato dishes. I think if you have potatoes and onions and garlic, then you can cook. And <laughs> I'm always satisfied, and I know most of my family, if, if we have tomatoes and green beans and things like that. So I'm basically a country cook, but I like a few gourmet things as well. And Like we have gourmet desserts here at the Hat House Cafe. Right. Cheesecake and things like that. And looking over your biographical information, I learned that you've been on almost every talk show imaginable. What was your favorite one? Um, I think Merv Griffin was one of the sweetest uh, and most supportive people, and probably Dinah Shore, I remember. And she also, you know, had a cookbook out, and she was a, uh, she's from Nashville, or she spent a lot of time in Nashville, went to Belmont College. But the first, uh, when I first started doing talk shows, I was very nervous, and she understood that and she had a big cooking segment on her show. I didn't have a cookbook out at the time, but I did help her with this uh, recipe that we had to do in that segment. And she'd go to commercials, and she'd always pat me on the shoulder. She was a lot taller than I thought she was when I met her because I'm about 5'1", and so she had to be about 5'7", or 8", and so she just kind of took this maternal role with me, and she said, you're just doing great. <laughs> and so I think she was probably the sweetest, one of the sweetest people to me. You really discovered a niche in your career, starring in traveling road shows like The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas and Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Why do you think that was such a natural success for you? I don't know. I guess it was an answer to prayer because my recording career was in a, a state of um, uh, dormancy, I guess. I had lost my record on track. The business, the recording industry was changing. I had gone through a divorce. I was married to my record producer at the time, and so Nashville has such a closed uh, community, the music community, and it's kind of clicky. And it is, quite frankly, a good old boy uh, society when it comes to the record business. So I was not able to get back on track with the record industry, and I was desperate to make a living and I was just praying about you know another door opening for me and I had the opportunity to do uh, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers and that was a success for me and it really helped me a lot with my confidence because at that point in time um, Nashville is not an easy town in spite of what a lot of people think and in spite of what you see on uh, the network you know that everybody's all warm and cuddly that's not always true and it is a tough town and I want to be honest about that because I want uh, music hopefuls to understand that going in so they don't go to Nashville and feel like there's something wrong with them and take this rejection and this challenge that they will be faced with as a personal thing against them as an artist. It's just a tough, you know, town to, to break into. So I think the musicals were an answer to prayer for me and I've been fortunate. So overall, are you proud to be back in Sevier County in East Tennessee? It was my choice. I'm extremely uh, pleased to be here and I'm at peace with myself. I feel it's a wonderful opportunity for me to spend time with my parents while they're still young enough to enjoy my company and me to enjoy theirs. And my son is now grown. He lives in Memphis and 
so he doesn't need me all the time and they can give me the attention that they used to always give him because <laughs> they used to I think when we were when he was smaller they used to love me through him and so now they have no choice they have to deal with me you know? <laughs> so so yes I'm happy to be home I'm sure a lot of our viewers remember that Carol Channing and Marilyn Monroe made the role famous that you played in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. When you accepted that role because of, you know, their recognition and because of their fame, did you feel like you had a lot of expectations to live up to? It was kind of overwhelming, but I really took the role because I thought I'll never be young enough to be asked to play a role this young again, so I better figure out how I'm going to do this. I have a tremendous amount of respect for Carol Channing. She's definitely a character that no one should try to, you know, uh, emulate. And certainly I do not have the ego, and I certainly don't think of myself as sexy. <laughs> and I've never tried to present myself in that way, so I certainly wouldn't try to play Marilyn Monroe. So I decided, hey, neither one of those women were, are from the South. Neither one of those women really had an authentic accent. And I stuck strictly to the book from my point of view. I mean, the play takes place in the 20s, and, uh, and she's from a little town, a little place in near Little Rock, uh, Arkansas. And I thought, I'm closer to that character than I think either one of them would be as far as like a country girl. So I decided to use as much of my sense of comedy as I could and just, you know, have fun with it. Not, be, not try to be sexy, not try to be, you know, um, outrageous just be what my funny self is and uh, I just had fun with her and it turned out real well but and but the audience didn't think that I was trying to act like Marilyn Monroe <laughs> because I wasn't trying to act like that and the audience didn't think I was trying to act like Carol Channing because I didn't want to be like either one of them I just wanted to play to the book and and try to make Laura li alive today as I would see her and looking at one of the articles on the wall here in your hat house, it said entrepreneur. That seems to be an underlying or, or a word that you see over and over and over in Stella Parton. Is that pretty descriptive of you? Oh, I don't know. I don't even know if I'm a very good business uh, woman, but I am a courageous woman. I like to, if I come up with an idea and I feel like it's uh, valid and it has some substance to it, I will try to figure out a way to, you know, make it work just like buying this little building and renovating it and trying to decorate it with as little amount of money as I could. And I am looking for an investor if anybody's interested. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I just decided to try to make it work. And I also wanted to have a place where artists could uh, uh, come in and, and display their work on the walls. We've had uh, several artists have their work displayed on the walls here and we have the back porch where musicians can come and play and it's just a laid-back place where we've got to make a living of course and make it pay for itself because we have employees to pay but it's a way for other people to have an open mic situation where they can come and say hey i like to sing i think i'm good will somebody kind of give me some feedback and they're welcome to do that here so i don't know if i'm an entrepreneur but <laughs> when I decided to write my first cookbook, I didn't go look for a publisher. I decided to self-publish it and that sort of thing. And to see if I could afford to do it, too. Because, you know, a lot of times when uh, people think you're a businesswoman, that you've got unlimited funds. That's not the case at all. It's just seeing what, how far you can go with what you're, you know, what you have. Your incredible talents have certainly allowed you to make your mark in the world as an entertainer. Do you think that having a famous sister, Dolly, has made it easier or more difficult for you? I think it's made it harder for me in a lot of ways um, because people have different expectations of me than what I think they should have on uh, overall. Uh, most people that don't know anything about me assume that I'm similar to her and I don't see myself similar to her other than we do sound alike, but we grew up in the same family we're from the same part of the country we have the same genes but I have a completely different personality I think um, and I think a lot of times people think well that's just another dolly so uh, there's not enough room in the world for another dolly so um, I get kind of passed over I think a lot of times on uh, certain things and certain you know projects because people think that I'm just like her and that I can't bring anything new or exciting to the project and that has that's no reflection on her um, or me, but I've had to, you know, deal with that. And so I guess it's made it 
really difficult it at has. times to But it's yourself. made me tougher because I figure, you know, in spite of that, uh, I'll see how far I can go and how much I can create on my own and do um, from what's back here behind my eyes and what's in here from, you know, from myself because life is a gift and we each have our own individual, you know, uh, roads to walk and so I'm not afraid. With both of you being entertainers, have you had many opportunities to work with her? No, actually when you think about it, I never thought about it until a few years ago, we are competitors. See, I was always so concerned about her acknowledging my work and her, she was always so busy with her career and the challenges that she had that I never thought of us as competitors, but we are in that area. Mm -hmm. But as we've gotten older, I realized that we're sisters first and, and that's what we've always been, that's what we'll always be. And that's what I concentrate on. If we ever do work together, it'll have to be a natural progression. It won't be because the public or a group of people say, oh, this is a clever idea, let's do this. Because right. this clown, excuse me, I shouldn't say that, but this guy <laughs> <laughs> called last week and he had this great idea. He wanted to get me, because I was Dolly's sister and Kenny Rogers' brother, to record this song for some game thing he had. Oh, so he geez. just knew I'd just be thrilled out of my mind to do this for him. And I said, not hardly, but you know, you have a deal like that at least once a week go down, so uh, that you have to say, no, I don't think so. You mentioned your son earlier in the interview. Has it been the ultimate challenge to be an entertainer and to be a mom at the same time? I didn't know that until it was completed, until he was an adult and he was on his own. And then I realized, whew, how did we get through that? But he's been such a beautiful person and being a parent to me has been the most beautiful blessing and I'm grateful every day that my son has grown into a beautiful human being and I got to be his mother it wasn't like oh you know uh, that's Tim's mom it's you know that's my son I don't think any interview with you would be complete without discussing your latest business endeavor Stella Pardon's best little hat house in the Smokies tell our viewers at home about that and the many things that they can enjoy when they visit here well, it's what I like to think of as an Appalachian coffee house. Uh, I've traveled a lot in the last 25 years, and I've been to a lot of different coffee houses in New York and in Brazil and different places. So I thought that would be kind of the idea of this. And uh, so that's what it is. It's, we've decided to call it a cafe, Stella Parton's Hat House Cafe. Last season we opened and we did a lot of cooking from my cookbook, recipes from my cookbook. We didn't have a professional chef, which we do now. Larry Turcott is our uh, chef and um, so we're lucky to have gotten to that stage. And we have our gourmet coffees, which we're getting ready to market uh, three different kinds. Our house coffee is a blend of mine called uh, Coon Hunter's Blend. But we have music every night that we're open Tuesday through Saturday night, and then I do my little show in the listening room Thursday through Saturday. And you have to tell them about your hat collection. Well, that's kind of why it got its name, the Hat House, uh, because of my extensive hat collection. Uh, I wanted to display that and get it out of storage and quit paying storage on, you know, hat boxes. So I decided, well, I'll sell hats. And it started out that way on the parkway as a boutique. And then when I bought this whole building over here on Wares Valley Road, I thought, well, we'll just have a coffee house. And we'll have one section where we sell hats and T-shirts and so on and so forth. But we'll have music. Now we've turned into basically a restaurant and a music place. So we're just kind of a painting in progress, I guess. What's in the future for Stella Parton? Any long-term goals? Uh, well, I just completed a new CD that hopefully will be released in Australia. I tour over there some, and uh, they have shown an interest in this, and I have a recording contract uh, in negotiation with them. It's all new material, which is part of the material that I do in the show called A Songbird's Heart. So I want to try to get that out this year, and hopefully what I'd really like would be to have a successful CD out in the domestic market, but if that doesn't happen, I'm not going to stay awake at night crying about it. All right. Thank you so much for talking with me. We're going to be closing this show with some of the highlights of the great entertainment that you provide here at the Hat House for your guests and visitors, and I want to thank you again for having us. Thank you, Chris. I've enjoyed